Hello, everybody. How are you all? I hope you're all doing well. Hope you're enjoying the day. Uh, it's been a great day here in Peter's living room, and it's going to continue. Uh, I have with me somebody actually been waiting for this because indirectly, I guess I have a connection to the topic uh, because of my ex-wife and my kids, my daughters. Uh, but I have with me Amy Byer Shaman. How are you? Hi. Hi, Peter. I'm so you pronounced it right. <laughs> yeah. Okay. You know what? Um, you know, it's funny. Uh, for years, it was like I always screwed up the last name. Right. And then all of a sudden, I woke up one day, and it's like even names, you know, 12 letters, one vowel, I get it right. Okay. All right. So, uh, <laughs> yeah, quite, a, quite amusing. And, uh, one, I'm glad you're here. Thank you. Well, I'm happy to be here. Like we said, we know each other, and so um, I'm very happy to be on. All right. Um, the reason she's here, uh, you, you know, unfortunately, I remember I used to chair uh, Relay for Life for like three years for Cancer Society, and one of the lines they had is, uh, if not you, um, everybody knows someone who was afflicted uh, with some sort of cancer, right. uh, whether they survived or not the family, friends, personal, that kind of stuff. And uh, being that my heritage comes from uh, the Eastern European part of the world, uh, when my girls were young, I, I've got uh, initiated into the BRCA. Right, gene. right. BRCA is the correct way. A lot of people know it as BRCA, the BRCA gene, but it's really the correct way to say it is BRCA. Right. Um, I guess a, a, a quick synopsis so uh, listeners who may not know exactly what that is. BRCA, well, there are tumor suppressing genes, uh, BRCA1 and BRCA2, and we all have them. It's people who have a mutation in a BRCA1 or BRCA2 gene that have an increased risk for certain cancers. Is, is there a special meaning to BRCA? Breast cancer, BR, BRCA okay. cancer. Okay. Oh, all right. All right. Got it. I didn't do that. <laughs> I always thought it was something scientific or well, by the founder of the. Well, it was also found in Berkeley, California, by Dr. Mary Claire King. So yeah. Okay. Um, well, you have a book out, and I know you're uh, right now. You're doing a book tour. Well, look, I'm doing as much as I can do. Right. Um, this, I'm very passionate about this. Um, I'm an indie author, and so you have to, you know, grind it out and, and do a lot of it yourself. Yeah. I mean, my priority right now, I still have teenagers, so I'm a mom, I drive the minivan, yeah. I still have dinner. You've got a life. Yes, I have a life. So, but this, you know, when I'm not doing all of that, this is what I'm doing pretty much 24-7. Yeah. You can ask anybody. They're like, oh, that's Amy, the BRCA responder. <laughs> Okay, well, I mean, I know people who know about it. I know people who know people who yes. had breast cancer. Right. Um, that's pretty much where their involvement ended, mm -hmm. whether uh, they ended up being a caretaker or just a supporter. Um, but evidently, you did a lot of research, and I'm curious what it was in your life that got you or steered you into not being just somebody who knew somebody. Right. Okay. Well, it all, it, if we go back to my beginning, well, the beginning of cancer in my family actually started many, many, many years ago. Yeah. Um, but we didn't necessarily realize that until 2008 when my sister was diagnosed with both breast, uh, with both uterine and ovarian cancer. Yeah. And it was at that time you know, she went through chemotherapy, and she they were two separate primary cancers. It wasn't, you know, ovarian cancer that spread to the uterus. It was an ovarian cancer and a uterine cancer. Separate entities. Two separate primaries. Yeah. And at that time, while her oncologist and her health care providers, they really did save her life, um, at that time, no one really recommended genetic counseling or genetic testing. And it was only until... A year later, a year later, after she finished, that she went to an ovarian cancer conference. That she was like, "Oh my goodness, I was under fifty years old when I was diagnosed." 
I also had two separate primary cancers. And, and then another red flag was I was of Ashkenazi Jewish descent. So, you know, that went off on her, in her head of, oh my goodness, those are the signs of hereditary breast and ovarian cancer right. syndrome, right. HBOC or carrying a BRCA gene mutation. So she then took that information back to her providers and then requested genetic counseling, at which time she was tested and subsequently tested positive for a BRCA1 gene mutation. One of the, it's one of the three mutations associated with people of Ashkenazi Jewish descent. Right, but we should let people know it's not exclusive. It's not exclusive to Jews at right. all. <laughs> no, there are thousands of BRCA mutations. There are right. three Jewish Ashkenazi founder mutations that are prevalent in uh, the Jewish community. And, and just to put it in perspective, um, although it's more common mm -hmm. with Ashkenazi, and you can throw out the number, but if it's like if one out of 40. One in 40, one in 43. Right, and non-Ashkenazi would be? One in 500, one in 800. So it's still a lot. Yeah, I mean, well, general population yeah. is one in 500, one in 800. You know, um, certain ethnicities do have higher risk. And also if you have triple negative breast cancer, that in breast cancer diagnosis, yeah. that's, they're usually going to test you for BRCA gene mutation. Right. So, um, yes, Ashkenazi Jews definitely need to pay attention. But there, there are Ashkenazi Jews that I know that carry a BRCA gene mutation, but it's not one of the Jewish founder mutations. Yeah. And on the other side of that, there are people, for example, someone in my book I write about, yeah who is not Jewish or did not grow up Jewish, she grew up Protestant, and she actually carries a BRCA1 gene mutation, the same exact one that I have. Okay, so you, if yeah. you're carrying it, mm -hmm. that doesn't necessarily mean you're gonna pass it along. It doesn't, your kids, if you are a carrier, yeah. and your partner or your spouse yeah. that you have had the child with is, is not, your kids have a 50% chance. Right. It's yeah, an auto, autosomal really, dom yeah. dominant yeah. condition, meaning, you know, um, Yes, like you each, you, I have two BRCA1 genes and two BRCA2 genes. My BRCA1, one of them is mutated. So my kids have a 50% chance of inheriting my mutated Now, can they get BRCA1. tested to see if they have a mutation? They or? can't. I mean, that's a whole other discussion. You want to test basically, and look, I'm going to preface this by saying I, I am not a certified genetic counselor. Okay. I, I happen to know a lot about genetics, and I'm a digital ambassador for the National Society of Genetic Counselors, and who has a certain amount of knowledge in genetics and genetic right. counseling. Um, Probably know a lot more than some of the I think I, I do know more yeah. than the average person, and yeah. I'm confident in saying that, but um, by no means am I an expert, mm -hmm. and I always preface whatever I say by that because I think that's important, but I, I do have a good knowledge base. Um, and then again, I forgot your question <laughs> right now. Uh, that if, um, couldn't, uh, if you have... Oh, the child, when do you test? Yeah. yeah, well, the genetic testing of children is, that's a whole other conversation, really, and you only do that when there are genetic mm -hmm. syndromes that could affect a child or that you can do something about it. You, you only really do provide those, that testing when it, when it can serve meaning, have right. meaning. Um, so for example, what I know about is BRCA and BRCA1 and 2, um, the screening protocols mm -hmm. at breast MRI for women start age 25, you know, okay. uh, for women. And prior to that, um, and so that's usually the age they recommend, you know, the testing to coincide. Um, for men, you know, uh, that is like prost prostate again exams um, right. recommended at age 40. Now, you can have conversations with your children when they're age 16, 17, 18, I guess if you want them to be familiar with their body, especially if there's cancer in your family. Right. Um, really, it's 10 years, you want to be doing an actual BRCA testing if there's BRCA in your family. Um, 10 years prior to the earliest cancer diagnosis in your family, and or at age 25 for women. For, right. for men, that 
can be a little different. There's no hardcore number. Um, definitely wait until they're an adult because at what point, what meaning will that provide them when they're, and then right. there's the emotional, emotional component. If there's nothing you can do with that test information, why burden someone with right. that information at the right. test? Why let them live a life saying, oh my God. I'm yes, at the same time, because there is cancer risk, you still need to be aware. So age 18, eight, nine, age 19, you know, talking to my daughter about being aware of her body, yeah. manually doing checking of her breasts, going into their early 20s. Now when she's an adult and when she's 18, she could decide she wants that information and you know that's gonna be her decision. Right. But age 25 is sort of that. Okay. And okay, let, let's say the mother yeah. has the mutation. Right. The kid, whatever, 25 gets tested, they don't have the mutation. Right. Could the next generation actually get a mu the mutation or because she's not ca um, carrying it? Well, it, de it also care? depends. We're getting really kind of into genetic counseling yeah. here. Um, I don't know the fault. Are you talking about me personally or the in, in general? Well, if the father, if the father of that child has been thoroughly assessed properly right. and has no mutation currently known and the mother for sure is known but you know, right. uh, legitimate clinical testing right. and has been counseled and assessed properly, right. but she's a BRCA1, let's say, gene mutation. And that child then has no mutations. They are considered what's called a true negative. Okay. Okay. But these are things that, this is the reason you go to a genetic counselor yeah. and a certified genetic counselor. I'm going to say that, people. Certified genetic counselor. NSGC.org. Go there to find one. Um, you really want the right, most qualified specialist assessing you, right. ordering the right tests, and then interpreting those tests. Right. That's key. Uh, yeah. The interpretation. Interpretation key. Because yeah. if, if you're negative, that doesn't necessarily mean you're in the clear either. Right. Because there are, there are, you could have a family history that there's no known gene mutation known, currently known. Right. Uh, and just out of curiosity, and I want to move on, I want to talk more about yeah, the book. Yeah, sure. Um, I forgot what I was going to say. That's okay. Yeah, that would happen. You right. want to talk more about the book, but first you want to ask me something else right. before we well, move thanks on. Thanks for bringing it back. <laughs> thanks for bringing it back. Um, we'll come back to that. Okay, that's fine. We'll come that's back okay. To that. This happens to me all the time, by the way. Really? Where I forget. This is what we're getting real here. It's a side effect of early... Surgical menopause, basically. Oh, I'm going through menopause. Yes, you're going through manopause. Manopause. It's and where a man pauses. Right. And they right. can't remember anything. Okay, so you have a book, uh, Resurrecting Lily? Resurrection Lily. Resurrection Lily. Is Lily yes. your sister? No, Lily, okay. Lillian was my grandmother. Okay. And she, when we were talking earlier, you said, when did this all come to fruition, basically? Yeah. And I said, well, we didn't really know until my sister in 2008, but my grandmother Lillian, Lily, um, died in 1934. And we realized after, you know, we tested positive for BRCA1, and then we realized, oh my goodness, my dad, because we inherited this from our father, mm -hmm. and that's very important to note, men can carry, pass on. And uh, my dad's mom had died when she was 33 in 1934. And then we realized some some aunts. Whoops, I'm moving the mic. Some aunts that had breast cancer. You, you, the puzzle pieces basically started to come together. And at that point, then I actually did some genealogical research. Yeah. And uh, there's a in my book. There's um, what's called a pedigree, which shows that uh, my genetic counselor did for me shows my dad's side of the family, and just you can the cancer throughout is. So is it is it a story about the passage, or is it more of a be aware of this, be aware of Well, that? the story itself, I, I, I say it's a story of inheritance and intuition, mm -hmm. of what surfaces in your body, but also in your spirit when you are linked by DNA. Right. And so it's, it's about... Yes, my story and finding out about my gene mutation and how that happened. And then my sister di diagnosis and then my friend Kristen, 
who had breast cancer, who she was um, an anchor here um, at WPBF News and other friends and family. But it's also a story about the relationship and the intuition and what I have felt from my grandmother and her sort of whispers to me and guiding me to kind of save my own life. Yeah. So you didn't have any point in time to look at her and go, thanks, Grandma. <laughs> <laughs> well, you know what? I wish I could have looked at her yeah. and said, thanks, Grandma. You know, um, that's the sad part. I never got to meet any of my grandparents on either side. Right. But I felt, I feel a huge, huge kinship with her regardless. It's, it's really uh, undeniable. You know, it's, um, you got to say thank goodness for technology. Uh, unfortunately, you know, we can go back uh, generations. Um, and, of course, well, you know, so-and-so died. You know, they, they said it was a heart attack or natural causes. Uh, they didn't have the technology or the knowledge to know what these diseases were. Right, right. And, and I felt... Um, a certain responsibility yeah. because because she didn't have what is available to her now. Yeah. How could I not take advantage of the information and the knowledge and do something about it? Not just sit on that information and wait for cancer to come. I had an opportunity to prevent cancer from happening to me with my right. exceedingly high risk, and and that was what she, her life. She lost her life. I feel in order to give me that information. Well, that's a good way of looking at you it. Know? Anyway. Yeah. So I feel I would be very you know, remiss and not honoring her if if I just sat on that information. Uh, let's talk about the, the family support. Mm -hmm. um, well, when your sister was diagnosed uh, or your involvement now with it, and, uh, of course, what you do to protect yourself and uh, I would think your kids. Right. Um, do they get involved with it, or is it uh, just mom's on her crusade? You mean my family in particular? Yeah. yeah. No. Look. <laughs> well, I must say, my husband was definitely ready for me to finish the book. Yeah. <laughs> He's like, "Would you finish the book already?" Because it took me eight years, and it was a—it's hard, especially when you're writing about such an emotional, <sighs> emotionally fueled subject. You have to walk away from it, then you have to come back, and then you. And I also, and I came from so many different perspectives. I came from the such the emotional side of it because you want that to be the story, and then I came from the I wanted the science to be a part of it as well. But my family has been very supportive. My kids see my advocacy. Um, you know, sometimes you have boys or girls. I have a daughter and a son. Okay. Yeah, and so no, everyone has been very supportive. I think. Now that the book is out and they've read it, I think people even get what I'm doing on a whole nother level mm -hmm. because they're like, oh, wow. Um, and that's kind of what I really wanted to do with the book, too, is show a, um, you know, paint that tangible portrait of what it feels like alongside the hardcore science of, hey, what does it mean within your right. DNA right. when this happens? Um. I've got like so many thoughts uh, going through my head here. Um, okay, the book is out. It's available. Yes, right now it's available online. I kind of did a soft launch in December, it, yeah. and then this is sort of my big launch week. And I've been just, you know, when you're an indie author, I mean, look, the primarily the primary reason I wrote this book was when it comes down to it is to save lives. Right. It was very important to me to get no this out there, points. and. Um, I felt a huge responsibility to write it. And I also couldn't not write it because I'm a creative person right. and um, it just was in me. Um, but yes, it's available currently online, Amazon, Barnes & Noble, all online retailers. And you have a website that's a link to? Um, yeah, B B brcaresponder.com. Right. People and their links to, to get the book on that. Um, you know, the, the hope is I have a good reviews coming out and I'm doing more of these things right. and I'm going to be at book expo the end of May in New York. Um, I'm doing my, um, uh, books signing and launch tomorrow night at Temple Beth. Um, right. I've got, um, 
in San Francisco. Just so people know, where is the Temple? Oh, Temple Bethlehem's up in Jupiter um, on Central Boulevard. Right. I think it's 2250. Is that Rabbi Singer? Um, no. no, that's uh, Rabbi Lefkowitz okay. alone. Okay. Doctor. <laughs> anyway, okay. Um, so that'll be tomorrow at, from 6 to 9. And um, you just have to call there to let them know you're coming. I think mm -hmm. the information is on my Facebook page. Right. So as you start scheduling more book signings, yes. everything that'll be on the website. Yes, it's actually on my, yes. If you go to my website and click on news and events, yeah. I have everything currently that I'm doing on there. Uh -huh. And I, I have, like I'm doing, I just booked the, um, actually the St. Louis Jewish Book Festival, which I'm very yeah. excited about because I, I, I get a whole evening um, a, a, a whole evening to myself where we're doing a whole. So that you, that yes, you. yes, yeah. they're they're flying me in. It's very exciting. So, yeah. um, that's actually really a great thing, and I just want to do more of those things. Right. Well, what I'm leading up to with regards to the book signings and everything, uh, do you um, do people reach out to you like women's clubs or I say like the condo circuit or communities? their clubs looking for speakers is that something you do or yeah i've definitely done that in, in the yeah. past i mean i've been i i as you can say a brc advocate probably for the last eight or nine years yeah. and i've definitely i speak a lot um definitely with the book the book is just a new avenue um and something new that i can speak about i yeah. guess and so yes but please call me though because it's right. Hard, I, you know, I'm one person, I'm, right. and I, I have a publicist, and they're definitely helping me out a little bit. Yeah. But definitely, call me. Call me. Go to my website. Use my contact form. Best, best. I was going to say the best way is go to the website. And use the contact. Yeah, there's form. a contact form. All right, mm -hmm. and again, it's brca responder. Brca responder dot com. Dot com. Yes. Very great. So, with all of this, I mean, this is like heavy duty stuff. It is heavy. And, you duty. know, it's very emotional. It's, right. Uh, Eye opening, as you say. Mm -hmm. Uh, I, I've got some people say I'm sick, but I have a tendency when uh, something bad happens to find the lighter moment in there. I guess it saves my sanity. Uh, going through all this, when your sister was going through it uh, in your memory bank, was there any situation that you look back on and kind of giggle at and say, can you believe we did that or said that or, you know, Oh gosh. Well, there are moments of that. And I like, there's one part I write about in the book where my sister and I were giggling and laughing and skipping on the street after one of her, um, she had to have her um, belly drained um, at one point prior to her surgery. Yeah. And we were skipping and we were laughing and giggling. And that was a light moment. But I also write in the book that our laughter didn't last very long. Yeah. Because next thing I know, she was on the ground in pain, yeah. and to watch that, it's like nothing you want to watch ever. Uh, you know, someone you like. But there, yeah, definitely. When I was going through scans, and I brought my mother-in-law, hi, Grammy, um, and she's probably laughing on the other side right now. Um, I brought my mother-in-law. You know, and I write in the book, and here I'm thinking, oh my gosh, you know, images of my breasts are all over the screen, and I'm thinking, oh my gosh, you know, I wanted to say. This is what this is what your son uh, gets, <laughs> you know. Right. So not okay. on the billboard then. Your breasts weren't on the billboard. No, but they were like all, you know okay. they, they, they on the screen. So yes. you know they're just um, they're moments, and also it's just my personality is that you just sometimes have to laugh at things yeah. because what are you gonna do? I, I mean, got beaten up as a kid when I was a kid. Whenever I got nervous or threatened, I kind of giggled. Right. And this guy that I felt threatened by thought I was laughing at him. Yeah. He beat the crap out of me. Oh, gosh. <laughs> That's not good. And, well, yeah. You know. Yeah. But well, I, I survived. You, you're here. You survived. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Well, and that's... That's the thing. I mean, I've been able to survive and make it through, but yeah. by no means is this journey over. And we were right. talking that, about that a little bit before we even went on air. I mean, it, you know, I write about in the book what I went through, what a, the story, but I also write about the other side of the after effects of my preventative surgeries because yeah. I've had, you know, a mastectomy and reconstruction and I also had my ovaries out. 
and a hyster hysterectomy. So I've talked about um, those surgeries, you know, in depth, but I also talk about the after effects um, psychologically, emo emotionally, physically. Yeah. Um, and the people don't always take into consideration. No, they the don't. And, and end of people don't, and healthcare providers don't. Right. And that's sort of a void I'm trying to fill as well. And so I have some information and quotes from um, some, you know, well known physicians in there who happen to be BRCA right. positive um, as well. And they're talking about, you know, what pre vivers such as myself should do after these surgeries. You know, should we be taking hormone replacement just therapy? I'm just touching on things that really haven't been talked about. Yeah. All right. Well, you know what? Uh, I know we've been talking for a while to get you in here. Yes. I'm glad it finally happened. Yes, absolutely. Of course, I wish you a lot of luck with the book. Thank you. I hope your message gets out. I hope people. More than one person, you know, gets enlightened and uh, does something to make sure they're going to be all right, or at least get a, know what's going on. Right, and and what I I mean, what I'll say to wrap it up a little bit is, if you are out there and you're listening and you're like, oh my goodness, well, I'm concerned about my cancer risk, or you know really pay attention. Is there prostate cancer in your family, pancreatic cancer in your family, breast cancer, ovarian cancer, um, melanoma even, you know, is there a pattern in your family? Do you have an inkling? Yes, you can bring it up to your healthcare provider, but mm -hmm. they may not be really educated and, and schooled in genetics. So I would either ask for a referral to a certified genetic counselor or find one on your own by going to um, NSGC.com and that's the National Society of Genetic Counselors and you can click on find a genetic counselor and you can speak to one by phone too not just in person so a lot of people who are, are really scared and nervous and they know the ins and outs of insurance they know they can they can really go through and and talk about what 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 genetic testing would look for, like for you right. and do you even want to do it Right. So, so I would say talk to somebody like that who really knows what they're doing. Okay. Well, I hope that was enough for you today. <laughs> um, again, everybody, Amy Dyer, Shaman, BRCA Responder com. BRCA Responder com and BRCA Responder. Right, on and the book is media. available on Amazon and all those places and through our website and social media. I mean, you're on social yeah, media. Yeah, social media. Please tweet to me if you have a question. And if it's you're, all under your name. Yes, BRCA Responder or, yes, at BRCA Responder or Amy Byer Shaman. I'm all over social media, right. Instagram, Twitter. Tweet me. All right. Again, everybody, Resurrection Lily. Check it out and uh, check yourself out. Again, thanks for coming Thanks, here. Peter. Bye, everyone. You're listening to uh, Peter's Living Room here on the World Entertainment Information Network. Uh, just thank you for listening. You know, I always, uh, I think I end every show by saying uh, I appreciate that you spent some part of your day with me. So have a great night, everybody. Uh, don't forget, tonight on WEI Network, we've got uh, Mickey Lolich, uh, great, one of the great uh, Major League Baseball players, pitcher. Uh, the only pitcher in Major League history that pitched three complete games and the only one that hit pitched three complete games and hit a home run in the World Series. So with the start of foot, uh, football, with the start of baseball season, it's apropos that you know, he'll be on the show tonight. <laughs> so thanks for being with us, everybody. Have a great day, and um, we'll see you on the radio.